The Deaf Dying Diagnosis and Doulas podcast has more to share. Our daily advice will help you to access information through conversations and feel empowered. Follow Doula Connections on Facebook and Instagram. Hey, welcome to the podcast. Going to be a fascinating day today talking to the awesome Kerwin Ray. Is uh, has scaled businesses. He's been a mentor and a coach of mine now for about six years. And not only is he brilliant at business and helping and coaching people, but he's had a, quite a few experiences himself with uh, brushes with death, and in, including a recent one. And this is just going to be the best conversation. So let's get to it. All right. So good morning, or actually, is it good afternoon? I don't know what time of the day it is, but does it really matter? So welcome to the podcast, and I'm so glad to see you this morning. So my, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever night. it is, wherever you are, it'll be a different time. So we don't really care about the time, do we? Came in, not at all. <laughs> all right. No, mate, so, right. so my special guest today is Kerwin Ray, who is the owner of Business Mastery International. And you have a massive, massive social media following. I, I know it's more than a million, but you can probably tell me how many people in your brand, Kerwin Ray. So it's a massive welcome to you. And you. I would love it if you could just tell us first up a little bit about you and your business and um, and your brand. Oh, beautiful. Thank you, Joy. It's an honor to be here. I, for those of you probably who don't know this, you'll learn this as we go. I've got a very intimate relationship with Julie. She's uh, been a very good friend of mine now for quite a few years. She's been on the journey with me for the last five, six years now. Yeah, five or six, yeah. Five or six, and um, it's been an incredible part of the journey. But I, I, I often sometimes struggle to, to answer the question, so what do I do? I, I think what I do is kind of in two parts. The first part is in really in the area of, um, and what I'm probably most well known for, well, depending on where you know me from, is in the area of business performance. You know, I've got this, uh, I've learned over the last 22 years of working with, you know, quite a few thousand businesses. I've, I've learned how to grow them and scale them quite quickly and help people put them under management. Um, and the second part of what I do is really the human, you know, business performance is part one. And the second side is human performance, which is really helping people understand how they can perform at higher levels. And whether that, that be as a parent, whether that be as a mother, as a father, as a sister, as a brother, not just as an entrepreneur, it just so happens it lends itself really well to the entrepreneurial space, to the military space, uh, and the competitive space, the athletic space, um, but just people in general. And that's probably, I guess you could say more around my sole purpose is really helping people. I love, love, love to help people, but it just so happened I, I stumbled across, across some really powerful experience and methodology early in my career that I applied to business uh, and learnt, um, was very, that learnt that was very effective along the way. And along the way, as I've built not just my own companies, but helped build other people's companies, and we've so far added over a billion dollars of revenue to our clients over the last, it's just probably in the last seven or eight years, um, I've just had to learn how to perform in some of the most challenging situations, but also how, how do you transfer that knowledge? How do you also help other entrepreneurs, other people, other parents, um, mums and dads and everything else, how to perform in really challenging situations. Because, you know, life is one of those things. It's not always roses and sunshine. You know, oftentimes, um, you know, life is littered with storms and even the occasional cyclone and natural disaster. And, you know, it's easy to show up when the days are, you know, 28 degrees and there's not a cloud in the sky, but it's really tough to show up when there's uh, a natural disaster heading our way or you're in the midst of a cyclone. And that's really where I love to play. Yeah, and I know that's certainly been happening up there where you guys are literally, in Australia. And it's literally, just as we speak, and I, it's, a mess. it's almost mm. yeah, symbolic. Yeah, absolutely. So your tagline is helping people. And again, yeah. I know you've just talked about how you do that through business and social media, but where did that passion come from? And when did you realise that that's what you were here to do? Yeah. Oh, it's kind of weird. I, I think I'm going to answer that question very differently to maybe the ways that I've answered it before. You know, I, I, I was very lucky to come across my purpose in my late 20s and not by accident, mind you. And I think oftentimes people confuse a purpose as something that should be, uh, they're entitled to know what it is from day dot. And it's not. It's something, you know, I think, you know, I think we have two purposes in life. You know, our first purpose in life is to find our purpose. And our second purpose in life is once we found that purpose is to live it. Um, and so I feel quite blessed. I think I found around my late twenties and I really just looked at my life and I looked at the things that I had done where I'd, you know, had the most fun, found the most flow, lost the amount of, the most amount of time. And by losing time, I mean, you know, the things that you do that where you just look up and then it's three hours later. And the areas that I, I discovered that 
I was innately showing up was in the area of helping other people. And I tracked it all the way back to my youth and my ch- even my childhood. Look, I, although I didn't have a lot of friends at school, um, that's a whole nother story, Julie. I, um, <laughs> I always seemed to attract the kids that were having problems, you know, mm. whether it be problems at home or problems with other kids or problems with their girlfriend. I always seemed to be the kid that people would come to and ask for advice, um, which was really quite strange because I didn't have a lot of friends, but I just seemed to attract the kids that needed support and advice. Uh, and even in my earlier career, you know, I, 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 I've always found myself someone who likes to help people, who likes to protect people. Um, and yeah, so where did that come from? You know, once upon a time, I would have, would have said from my experiences uh, just growing up, but now one of the things I've started to realize, I think like any animal we're, we're, or any mammal, you know, we're all born with a purpose, you know, and I think sometimes it's easier to be an ant than it is a human. I think it's easier to be a horse than it is a human because, you know, ants innately know what their purpose is. They know what they they know where they fall in terms of the hierarchy of their colony, and they know exactly what they have to do every day. You know, horses themselves, dogs themselves, other forms of mammals—they're very instinctive and they know what to do. And I think humans, we we we've been given you know three sets of hardware: the reptilian brain, the mammalian brain, and this really complex, sophisticated unit called the the neocortex. And the neocortex gives us you know the opportunity to contrast and you know make an executive level of decision and problem solving. But it also makes it very difficult for us to tune into our instincts. And I think for me, you know, why I do what I do is it's what I was here, was what I was put here to do. You know, it's, I guess you could say what I'd refer to now is the language is coming to me is my soul's purpose. Yeah. Um, but at first, I think I wanted to do what I do because I wanted to make money. Uh, and then I wanted to do what I wanted to do because I wanted some form of, you know, validation and adoration. And maybe at some stage, I, I think I did want fame until I got it. Um, but then as I've kind of peeled away the layers, especially in the last six months, I've just realized that, you know, we all have a soul purpose. Um, and you know, our job is really to find that. And once we find what that is, it's to learn how to express it in a meaningful way. Wow. Fabulous answer. I love that. So I've heard you talk a lot in the years that I've known you about, uh, you know, brushes with dying. Okay. And (laughs) and that's what the podcast is about. So let's face it. So are you happy to to talk about anything then? Total open book. Awesome. All right, because I just want to make sure we're comfortable with the questions. Yeah, and I thought, no, oh, well, he doesn't have to answer them if he doesn't no, want no, to. But I'm comfortable good. with it. All right. So how many, like, and I know number is a bit of a thing, but, I mean, how, I like, I, when would you say your first brush with dying came about and yep. and how many times do you think that's happened to you from there till now? Um, ah, oh, gosh. The first proper... I guess you could say what I'd refer to as when I really thought I was going to die. I was at the age of 15. It was 13 days after my 15th birthday. And my mum was overseas at the time. She was in Hong Kong and I was staying with some friends of the family. <clears throat> and um, the friends of the family that I was staying with, they had a, there was a brother there who was not, who was 20 and he had a friend who was up from Adelaide who was 19. And they were like the coolest guys. And you know, I, one of the guys, he had this really cool Celica, Toyota Celica, which had mag wheels on it. And he was the cool guy. Jason was his name and he was a really really cool guy. And I loved hanging out with that family because I loved hanging out with Jason because he was almost like a bit of a, a role model in a way. Cause you know, he was a good looking guy. He had a really, you know, fit body. He had a beautiful girlfriend and a cool car. And so anyway, we're hanging out one day and we go to the pub and he picks up a six pack of, of West coast coolers. And I lived in, um, Kelso in Townsville at the time, which is, a, I guess you could say a semi-rural area, depending on where you are in Kelso. And we drove up to the, the Ross river dam and we set up the dam and we, drank a few brewskis on, on the side of the, on side of the, the ramp up there. And I was on my second, um, West coast cooler when a mob of roos went jumping past and I literally jumped up and I went running after these roos in long grass and I was running down a steep slope, long grass, like really, really long grass. Couldn't even see the, the ground I was running on. And I was chasing these roos and I got to the end of the grass and there was a big drain and I stepped into the drain and I fell across the drain and onto the road on the other side of the drain with the bottle in my hand. And I don't know if you can see there, we've got some really gnarly scars. I've got two big gnarly scars. I cut all my nerves, all my tendons and my main artery. Um, And um, yeah, I nearly bled to death on the side of the road there. And I was very lucky that um, I was able to, my friends were arguing about what they were going to do while I pulled my own singlet off and wrapped it around my arm. And then they eventually got me into the car, took me to the medical center. First medical center I I went to refused to see me because I didn't have a Medicare card, (laughs) covered in blood, bleeding to death, like barely conscious. Second medical center that they, they took me to, they rushed me straight in, put me in an ambulance, and it just so happened that the ambulance was, the ambo driver was, was going off duty. And so he took me to the, um, to the dispatch center, and he waited for 15 minutes until the next guy clocked on before the next guy clocked on, then took me to Townsville General Hospital. 
Uh, and by then I'd lost a, a lot of blood. They'd, they'd stopped a lot of the bleeding, but I'd still lost an enormous amount of blood. I had to have uh, two blood transfusions and 13 and a half hours of microsurgery. Uh, but I guess it was at that point that I realized for the first time, I didn't realize as, as a 15 year old, but I now realize on reflection, especially with the um, conversations with the doctors afterwards, that I, yeah, I nearly lost my life that day. Um, and um, I lost some capability. I was told that I'd be lucky to get 20% use of that hand back. And I worked like an absolute savage to, to, to really overcome what, was, what I was told I was going to have, which is a physical disability. But the doctor's punchline was, well, don't worry, at least you'll be eligible for disability pension. And I was like, mate, I don't want to be, el-. in my mind, I'm like, but I don't want to be eligible for disability pension. I want to be a fighter pilot. I want to, I want to do things. I want to, you know, I want to be a, I want to do things. And um, yeah, thankfully I had a lot of drive and determination and I'm very grateful for that experience. And that might sound a little bit strange, but that experience really taught me the importance of overcoming massive obstacles in the face of, like, I didn't have one person that told me I was going to get my hand back. Even when I used to go to physical therapy. Um, all the physical therapists, because I used to sit there crying whilst just trying to, you know, just trying to touch my fingers together and pinch wax. They would just say to me, it's okay, son, just let it go. Just let it go. It's not coming back. And it's a really, when in reflection, it's a really strange thing for, a, you know, an OT to, to, to say to a young boy, 15 years of age, he's trying to get his hand back. But it just made me more willing and more determined. Um, and now I'm, I think I have maybe a, a 15% deficit in that hand. If I'm like, the only thing I can't do is close these fingers like this. Yeah. Uh, and so every now and then I look like I'm like, if I'm drinking tea, I look very, very proper because my, my little pinky sits out there. But um, so that was the first one. Um, uh, Julia, uh, to be honest, I've, I've decided to stop counting. Um, but if <laughs> I thought you Yeah. Cause it's kind of, <laughs> it, it gets a bit, um, you know, but to be, you know, if we we're going to put a number on it, it's like eight, eight experiences I've had now that have ranged from a whole range of different types of experiences. Um, you know, and the most recent ones being in 2009, I suffered my first stroke, um, which the doctors thought was miraculous that not only I, I lived and survived, but also that I wasn't left severely deficient um, and disabled. Uh, and then I had my second stroke, most recent near death experience. And that was in September last year, September 8th last year. And I had a, like in, in comparison to the first stroke I had, the first stroke I had was about two and three quarter centimeters in diameter. And the one that I just had in September was about four centimeters by five centimeters by almost four centimeters. Again, it was like basically almost the size of my fist, um, in the right superior parietal kind of crossing over into my frontal lobe there. And, um, yeah, it was, uh, it was a, a lot, the first stroke was very NDE and by NDE, you know, I got to have, I guess, because I had a conversation with the creator, whereas this one was quite traumatic. It was me by myself with my son. Um, I was paralyzed on the left-hand side. Like I was stumbling and tripping over. I, 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 I couldn't even ring my girlfriend because at the time, as it was happening, I knew something was going wrong and I was trying to use my phone. I couldn't even use my phone. It took me a while to work out that my right hand was working uh, before I rang her. And it took me, oh God, I don't think I even got to hospital for about an hour uh, before I was put in hospital and then they put me in lights and sirens from Byron Bay up until the Tweed. And that was when they discovered I had a, um, a, a massive CVA. So really, so a massive difference in, in your experience from the first stroke oh, to the second one, like massive. Very. First so, one, I had nothing to lose. I was single, you yeah. know, nothing to lose. The second time around, my son was looking at me. Yep. Yep. So we're seeing you there right now. Can we talk about the most recent one first? Absolutely. Let's dive in. So I suppose I'm thinking about like the, what was was your feeling? Was it like, oh my God, here we go again? Or I, or you're just totally unaware of what was happening to you? Was there fear? Was there pain? Like what was going on with your awareness while it was happening? Ignorance at first. Like I'm, as I said, I didn't even call an ambulance. Um, um, but I, I felt a sizzle down the right-hand side of my tongue, and I, I, I just finished drinking a, um, a green drink, and I'm, the first thing I thought of is, oh, my God, I'm having an allergic reaction to something. Yeah. Uh, and then I was on, sitting on a beanbag with my son doing a puzzle, and then I, my son just looks at me, and he's like, he says to me, Dad, why are you talking funny? Mm-hmm. And that's when I, I, I realized, again, I was, I was just drooling profusely on myself, and I just grabbed my phone with my left hand, and I tried to stand up, and I stumbled, and I dropped my phone, and and I picked up my phone and I dropped it and I picked up my phone and I dropped it and I picked up my phone and I dropped it. And then I grabbed my phone and I tried to ring my partner and I went, went to voicemail. And as soon as it went to voicemail, that's when I panicked. Yeah. Because I was like, oh my God, I actually don't know what's going on here. I, and I knew with a relative level of certainty I, that I was having another stroke. But it, because the first stroke, I'd had, I'd had an impairment on the left-hand side because I was both on the right-hand side, but not like this. It was very different. Um, but I was still thinking, oh, it's okay. It's fine. And 
20 minutes later, my partner arrived and I'd rung Dr. Kylie at the time and I was telling her what's going on. She says, like, you need to get to hospital straight away. And I was, I was fighting. I had my, my, my PA there and I had Krista there and I was arguing with him because I wanted to drop Nara to school. And I was like, no, no, I'm just going to drop Nara to school first. And then I'll go. And like, <laughs> oh, and I, no, 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 no. You're going to hospital right now. And um, yeah, then I got taken to hospital lights and sirens and um, to the tweet. And yeah, that's when they, they did the scan and, and realized it was quite bad. So do you think that that's common when people are having experiences like that, a bit of a disconnect between the reality of what your physical ability at that point yeah. and what you think? Well, apparently with stroke, it's quite common. They refer to it as neglect because um, yeah. I had neglect for probably a couple of two weeks. And neglect is you just have no, cons- like in, in, the, in the way it manifested physically after that. Well, first of all, I had no consideration for my, my own personal safety. Mm. And all I cared about was was getting sure that, making sure that my son, I got to drop my son at school and you know, trying to convince everyone that I was fine. Meanwhile, like I'm completely paralyzed on the left-hand side of my face, my, my, my left hand and, and leg and arm. Like I was walking, if you'd put me in a straight line, I would have walked in a circle. Like I was bumping yeah. into things. I was all over the shop. But that carried on for at least another two to three weeks. I had complete facial paralysis for almost a month. Yeah. Um, because when it first happened, I tried to justify and say, it's not a stroke, you're having Bell's palsy. It's not a stroke, it's Bell's palsy. Mm. And I was like, and the funny thing was, I was trying to, Marie, I was like, I'd been texting Marie that morning and I was trying to, text marie what was going on and i and i couldn't i couldn't fucking text no. and so i thought i'll just do speech to text yep wow <laughs> and then i'm like i thought i'll have a fuck uh, <laughs> have you been able to hear that back well no because all it was coming up on the on the screen was voice to text so it wasn't uh, even a voice recording it was jumbled and wow. i'm like and so i'm trying i'm saying <clears throat> over and over and over and i was getting really frustrated um and so yeah i just had this very high level of neglect and um yeah yeah, on reflection, it was a slightly entertaining, but you know, it was also quite concerning as well. But I, I believe, from what I've been told, it's quite common to have levels of neglect um, during and after the stroke. But I was stroking for, I think I was stroking for a day and a half, which means mm. I was, my symptoms were progressively getting worse for a day and a half because not wow. the, the the injury was so, the cerebral vascular accident was so severe that it actually caused more bleeding, and so there was more pressure on the brain. Yeah, yeah. And I was waking up like in the middle of the night, you know, this actually was probably stroking for two days. I was waking up in the middle of the night thinking it was first thing in the morning. Um, wow. You know, I was very disorientated. didn't know where I was for the most part. You know, I was, I was, it was, it was at the time it was quite, um, it was really confronting, really confronting. Yeah. And you're such a determined bugger at the best of times. So I could only imagine people trying to say, who when you go to the hospital, you're doing this, you're doing that and you're resisting everything. Yeah, well, and it, and it hasn't really changed much. I, and I probably shouldn't share this because it's not exactly a great example of um, what I'd call, you know, high intelligence. But it was only a couple of days ago where I had some chest pains, and I was in the middle of I was on my last day of Nail and Scarlet up in here in, up here in Kingscliff, and um, I, I had a break, and so I, I ran up to the triage center up the road, and I said, "Look, I just want to get a um, uh, an ECG just real quickly, just to make sure I'm okay." I gave him my medical history. They looked at the ECG and the first thing he said after he said was there's a little deviation in the P wave. And he goes, I'm just going to put you in lights and sirens to the tweet. And the nurse is like, well, uh, we can't. Everything's flooded. It's all cut off. And he goes, all right, we'll organize a care flight. And I'm just like, well, fucking hang on a second. I'm the one who's we're talking about here. I'm not going anywhere. I said, I've got Mm -hmm. an event to finish. And he's like, mate, you, I don't think you understand with your history, what we're talking about here. And I said, look, mate, if I've had a fucking, if I had a heart attack, I know. And he goes, no, mate, actually, if you had a heart attack, you probably wouldn't know because if you've had a mild heart attack, the only way we can you know, work that is if, mm. had, if we do bloods right now. And so anyway, we had a bit of an argument and he just said, look, I'm going to trust your badge judgment here. And I literally did go tune in and go, okay, am I just being an idiot here? But yeah. I was like, no, nah, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm fine. And anyway, I went back and I, and I finished the event. But it's just, yeah, there's this part of me that just, I'm just learning. And, and, and Julie, I think you've been you know, a witness to many of this. I'm learning that I'm actually a lot more mortal than I'm willing to admit. You know, yeah. you know, my podcast is called Unstoppable because that's that's how I reference myself. I've always referenced myself as almost like a, um, a a terminator of sorts in terms of my ability to just keep pushing despite whatever's going on around me. But I'm just learning now yeah. that that's not necessarily always the most healthy thing to do. Nah, because uh, meanwhile, while you're doing that, everybody around you is failing their own sense of fear or, oh, my God, what's happening? And, and you're just you know, pushing through. So so thinking about your family in that last episode, um, because I know I know your, your personal circumstances now and, and where you're at. So what were you thinking about the family and what like, was there any were you thinking about anything much about them during that whole experience or in the was early it just part of the experience, focused on was, your own recovery? Well no, like it was it's 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 so there's so many intersections with that answer. Um yeah. the first one was Noah because I could see 
but no, it was he was quite affected. Like I could see it was a traumatic experience for the little guy. And so he was like my first concern. But you know, as um and a lot of people probably didn't know, but I also had a a partner who at the time was about um, you know, two and a half months pregnant or three months pregnant um at the time. And so I was, and all I could think about was um, you know, leaving these kids behind. And so there was this really strong sense of potential loss. And I didn't have yep. that the first time. The first time around, like, I, I know this sounds really weird, but, you know, I, I got given the opportunity to leave and I was like, fucking take me now. And it wasn't this desperate, you know, this desperate, depressed, oh my God, take me off this planet. I don't want to be anymore. I was like, oh my God, I've lived five lives. If I die now, it's not a shame. I'm happy to go. And then I woke, literally woke up. But at that time, I had nothing to lose. Whereas this time, mm-hmm. I felt like, you know, I've got a little baby boy in the way. I've, I've got a baby boy here right now. I've got a beautiful partner, her beautiful daughter. Um, and I, and I was just like, I can't leave. But then I started to struggle with the concept of, well, what if I do? And it's like, I had something to lose now. And, um, yeah. you know, that's the interesting thing. And in, 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 in Jason De Silva calls this the death practice. It's, it's not until we have something to lose that oftentimes we feel the most pain. And I was just feeling this enormous amount of pain about the potential loss of, you know, being a dad for the second time. You know, losing the opportunity to be a dad for my son. Because, yeah. you know, the wound that I had that I was reconciling was, you know, my dad's a great guy and he's a really lovely man, but um, he's he's more like a friend or an associate. Like he, he I never really bonded, and he's a good guy. And you know, I, I hope that he doesn't necessarily take this the wrong way because sometimes he used to spit this out without thinking about it because he's a really lovely man, but he just never felt like my dad. And so I, I, I really feel like I grew up without a dad, and he was overseas for the most part mm. of my youth anyway. And so my whole goal was to you know to be this most incredible father and be there for my you know, my, my son. And then the prospect yeah. of you know losing that it was just it was really confronting. Terrifying, absolutely, and and that's just such a great example of a massive difference from, you know, being that single person with, as you say, nothing, nothing no to people to be traumatized yeah. by you not being there and you not missing out on it, to, compared to where you are now. Look, I think that's a fantastic exp- example of that. So, have have you sat down with Noah since and said yeah. talked about the experience and? Because, again, I think there's going to be a lot of people that have their children have been in a similar circumstance where they've witnessed, you know, them being really, really ill. And um, so how how would you talk, how would you suggest or how did you talk to Noah about what he experienced? Well, Noah, Noah was, he was off for probably about two months. Like he just wasn't himself. Yeah. Um, and, I, and, you know, his mum tried to talk to him and I tried to talk to him and it was, and it was a little bit difficult to get him to open up. Um, because he was, he was quite emotional, but then I had a mate of mine come up from Sydney, Matthew Burke and full respect to Matty Burke. He's been um, one of my health practitioners now for about uh, probably a decade and a half. And he was doing a trauma release process with Noah. He did a trauma release process with me and then he did a trauma release process with Noah. And what was really interesting is I was absolutely, first of all, I was blown away by how much Noah remembered. He remembered easily four to five times of what happened than I did by an easy margin, probably more. And as Maddie was getting him to recall the whole memory of that day, he was just, he remembered every single minor detail from me dropping my phone to how many times I dropped my phone to, you know, the feeling of the look of terror on my face when, yeah. you know, when I tried to ring my, when Krista and she didn't answer the phone and, you know, and, but then it was getting to the point where, um, he, like the point where he realized it was real was when, um, my my PA was there and Chris was there and they said, okay, we're going to take you to the hospital because I've been speaking to Dr. K. And Noah was like, he, as soon as he heard the word hospital, that's when he thought, oh my God, that's where people go to die. Mm. And so that was the point where the trauma installed, I guess you could say, happened yep. for Noah. <clears throat> um, and yeah, and so really just helping him feel the emotions that come, came with that, that was a really, I think, important part of, of his recovery was allowing him to experience the emotions that he was probably pushing down. Cause at the time, you know, he was, there was a lot going on and there wasn't really a lot of space for this eight year old little boy to, or seven at the time, seven year old little boy to experience what was his emotions? What was he feeling? Mm. You know, there was just a lot of chaos and talking and me saying, cause as I said, I was fighting with everyone cause I wanted to drop him to school and he was like, but I want to, and he was like, but I want dad to go. But what I didn't realize the reason he wanted me to drop, drop him to school is he didn't want me to go to hospital. Yeah. And the reason he didn't want me to go to hospital is not because he, he was being a selfish little shit he, is die. he thought I was going to die. 
Yeah. Um, and so just really allowing him, and that's a big conversation in our, in our household at the moment. It has been for a while, but especially the last six months since the stroke is the importance of feeling the emotions. And when an emotion comes up, you know, we don't tell the kids not to cry. We, we, we encourage them to cry. We encourage them to feel their emotions and express their emotions. And because this whole experience has really enabled me to look back at my own emotional experiential profile and really understand why you know understand why the stroke took place because it's really easy to look at the medical because mm. the doctors were like we you know there's so many things that we don't understand about why you've had a stroke but when i started looking at i guess what you'd call the metaphysical aspects of why i had the stroke it was really apparent why it happened and why uh 40 years of repressed anger <laughs> yeah and you know the yeah, thing yeah. is, like, like, yeah, I know how much work you've done on yourself over these decades, and yet it's still fucking there. It's still yeah. hiding, and it comes and out. It, One of my teachers used to say to me, "The body presents the bill." Years yeah. ago, I remember him saying that to me. The body presents the bill, and I thought, "Oh, what does that mean?" But that's a great example. And you know, I've just learned more, so much more about what I already knew that I didn't understand about what I already knew. Um, and yeah, cause I, you know, my, as you're right. And, and I, and I'd spent decades working on myself, but I still felt something wasn't right. You know, mm. and I talked about this openly in some respects. Yep. Yep. Um, I still felt something wasn't right. I still knew that there was this anger bubbling under the surface and I didn't know where it was coming from. There was still some of these impulsive behaviors that I didn't really fully understand. Um, but it wasn't until I got put into a real container of intimacy and this is the thing that I've learned about, you know, the whole, there's two types of work. There's the peripheral work and then there's the deep soul work. And the peripheral work that I've done for decades was, you know, this, the psychology, understanding why, why the brain does what it does, understanding why we behave the way we do and learning how to regulate that psychology so that you can take some level of control back, learning how to regulate the neurobiology so that you can learn how to feel the ways that you want to feel when you don't feel good, learning how to regulate the biology, learning how to regulate the physiology. But I basically, all I'd done is I'd, I'd done an enormous amount of work and I'd learned an enormous amount, but I'd wrapped myself up in this container of learning how to make myself feel the way I wanted to feel because sometimes the way I felt didn't feel good and so I didn't want to feel it. Mm. And, you know, my big takeaway from this was understanding what an emotion is. You know, an emotion is nothing more than, you know, a neurochemical response, but that neurochemical response is a peptide, you know, a neural peptide. We experience something, it goes through a referential index you know, it tickles a little gland in our brain called the hypothalamus. And that hypothalamus releases neural peptides that travel down through the pituitary gland into the bloodstream. They connect with every cell in our body and every every organ, every tissue, every skin, nail, everything is made of cells. And that peptide, it links with those cells and it changes the way those cells behave. But what I learned is a peptide is a metabolite. And if we don't metabolize a metabolite, it gets stored. Just like if you eat too much sugar consistently, if you eat more sugar than your body can utilize, it stores it as another substance that if it builds up to such a level, it becomes toxic to the system and it can literally kill you. But yep. it's just sugar. But sugar over a period of decades and years that becomes stored fat in your tissues and your organs becomes quite toxic. And this is what I learned about emotions. When we don't metabolize emotions, when we, and, and what is, how do you metabolize emotion? You allow yourself to feel, feel the emotion in its full, fullest. Mm. And you allow it to f feel the emotion in its fullest to its completion. And so you utilize, because a protein, a peptide is a food. It's a protein. It is providing energy to that cell to behave in a certain way. And if you don't use all the energy that's been provided to that cell, that cell will store that energy in its tissue, in its cell. And that cell becomes tissue. And that builds up over time. And over time, it creates, you know, dysregulation, dysfunction, and even disease. Yeah. And, you know, and what I realized after suppressing 40 years worth of anger, it was, anger was just the defense. Anchor was, was what was keeping me safe from the emotions that I didn't want to feel below. Yeah. And so, yeah, I can sit there and say it was 40 years of repressed anger, but it was 40 years of repressed anger because I didn't want to feel, I didn't want to, I didn't feel safe enough to feel the emotions that were sitting below the anger, which was incredible levels of sadness, incredible levels of devastation and an enormous amount of grief. Yeah. And, you know, I'd protected myself with this anger because it was easier to be angry than it was to feel those things. Mm. And that just, you know, sent me on a, you know, on a path of, exploring what I'm now understanding is, you know, what is referred to as shadow work and really delving into, you know, the darkest parts of who I am to really learn how to heal because the anger was just a symptom, you know, yeah. and as we've learned through most forms of, you know, I wouldn't even say medicine, but, you know, big pharma intervention, which is you treat the symptom, but don't treat the cause. Okay. Yeah. But the more you treat the symptom without and neglect the cause, the, the worse the cause gets. And, you know, oftentimes people will treat the symptoms and the cause gets to the point where all of a sudden they find that they're going to die. 
And not because they couldn't have healed themselves, but they've just spent the last 20 years treating the symptom and not actually treating the cause. And yeah. what I realized for me, the anger was just a symptom of something that was much deeper within me that I just wasn't either ready, willing, or able to acknowledge. And that's where the stroke just went, well, we're just going to knock out your ability to um, control any impulse because one of the you know, side effects of stroke is you lose impulse control. And so all yeah. of a sudden, this 40 years of repressed anger, it started fucking spewing out of me. Like, and I had no control over it. And, I, and, and for someone who's spent decades learning how to control themselves, in very you know predictable and um, resilient and beneficial ways, I had no control, and all this anger just started pouring out. And you know I could have just sat in the anger and blamed all of the triggers that were coming up. But I started asking the question. I started getting curious and going, "Where's this fucking anger coming from?" And that's where I got really curious. And with the support of my partner and you know and other people around me, I started exploring into what's below the anger. And then I yeah. discovered sadness. And oh, what's below the sadness? The grief. What's below the grief? Devastation. And when I started allowing myself to feel these, these, these feelings and allow them to wash through me completely, I realized that they were associated with memories that I completely repressed. Mm -hmm. And there was an enormous amount of repressed memories from my childhood that were experiences, which would refer to as traumas that felt so unbearable. Like the traumas, the, the feelings felt so unbearable that my brain did what a brain does when you experience an unbearable trauma is it compartmentalized. It takes that memory and it goes and hides it somewhere. Yeah. So that it's no longer a conscious memory. It's now a subconscious memory. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you little symptoms here and there that will indicate that there's something deeper, but it's going to yeah. be up to you to be able to recognize that symptom to get to a level of wisdom and experience and age and whatever else is required to start looking below what's below the symptom. Yeah. See, I would say listening to all of that, that you're an incredibly creative guy because you weren't getting the little messages. Oh my God, you got a bloody big one. So, well, you know. Bricks and trucks. You know, the feathers were there. I felt the anger yeah, was under there. Yeah, I felt the, yeah. the bricks were when it came out in intimate relationships. There was lots of bricks that I, I had thrown at my head in intimate relationships, but the truck was the stroke. But, yeah. I'm, you know, I, I come back to the fact that you know, my partner, Krista, and this is where the soulmate union became so apparent to me, the importance of a soulmate union. It wasn't until I was put into a relationship with someone that just refused to leave me because it wasn't, they weren't with me because they wanted anything. They were with me because they were the, the other part of that soul that was created. And they were like, I'm just going to sit here and I'm going to stay here and I'm going to hold this space. I'm going to hold this container together and you can express all the ugliness you want and I'm going to love you anyway. But yeah. I'm not going to just sit there and take your anger. I'm going to help you find what's underneath it. And she reflected and reflected and reflected and reflected. But it wasn't until I got a point, and you know part of my story as well. Like I identified as open in relationships for probably the last seven or eight years since my, my marriage. And even before I got married, I identified as open. But what I realized was open was just a really good excuse of me not getting close to people. Yeah. Because what I discovered was whenever I got close to people, and typically it would be a woman, whenever I got close to them, that's when my ugly parts come out. That was when my anger would come out. And that's where the uncontrollable anger would come out. I was like, you know what? And my story was, maybe I'm just not meant to be in a relationship. So what I'll do yeah. is I'll have lots of relationships that are very surface peripheral level that don't allow me to go to the deep parts where they get to see that ugliness. Because I know when they see that ugliness, they're going to go, oh my God, that's fucking ugly. Oh my God, you're bad. Oh my God, you're just so angry. And I, I prefer to see myself in other ways. Yeah. And it wasn't until I allowed myself to really lean into the, this soulmate union that I uh, was reflected with such veracity that, man, you've got some shit you need to work out. Mm. Yeah. Wow. That, so, so what I was just, I suppose I'm thinking, so you've had all this incredible experience, you've had all this amazing awareness and you, you know, you're healthy, healthy and great by the look of you. But so what's the gift now? Because if your, your aim in life is to help people, which yes. I know it is. Mm -hmm. So how do you now use this experience and this new level of knowledge yeah. to now help more people? I'm still working that out. I've got my training wheels on. But what I'm learning so far is I'm learning about the importance of, because there's, there's, there's the mind's work, there's the body's work, and then there's the soul's work. Yeah. You know, and I spent the last 40 years doing, or let's call it 30 years, doing the mind and the body work. And now, now I'm at the point where I'm doing the soul's work. And the soul's work is to, identify, is to support us. Because, again, the traumas that I experienced as a child, they're not just my traumas. In most cases, they're ancestral traumas that were handed down, either through behaviors or epigenetics. And so, you know, I've had to understand, you know, what I've learned from this process is whenever we have a wound, that wound will often be wrapped in darkness so that we don't have to spend too much time in that wound. Because when we're in that wound, it feels bad and we want to avoid the feeling bad. We only want to feel good, right? For the most part. Yeah. And so we avoid the wound. But when a wound stays in darkness, do you know what happens to that wound? 
it festers. Yeah, the festers or, yeah. It festers. Mm. When a wound stays in darkness, it festers. Now, if you've got a cut on your skin and you, and, you, you know, and you leave it completely covered up, look, it might heal in time. But if you've got a cut on your skin and you expose it to light and sunshine, it's going to heal faster. Mm. And so one of the things that I've learned is in order for us to heal, we've got to find out what those wounds are. But the wounds often lie behind these emotions that, are, that we find very difficult not to express. And when we start, when I look below the anger, you know, I found the sadness. When I look below the sadness, I found the grief. When I look below the grief, I found the devastation. And when I experienced those emotions in their own time, in their own way, I then found the memories that they were associated to, the wounds. And yeah. once I shine the light on the wound, then I could process it. And then I could allow that wound to heal. And once the wound heals, then the soul shines brighter. Because yeah. But again, the soul needs to be able to shine that light on that wound. And again, I'm saying stuff right now that I've never said before in my life. And I, half the time I catch myself going, fuck, you sound like a quack. <laughs> but it's true. Like, this yeah. is, And I'm talking not from a fucking book here. I'm talking from this is my actual experience, Julie. As you know, that's how I, that's how I operate. And as I shine light on these wounds, these wounds start to resolve because I start to understand them. And I start to realize, you know what? It wasn't my fault. The way, because that happened, it wasn't my fault. And you know what I'm like? I've got a fucking 50 million video view out there right now. Where I'm screaming at people, everything's yeah. your fault. <laughs> yeah. you know? But now I'm realizing everything isn't your fault. Oh. But the moment you become aware of it, then it becomes your responsibility. Yeah. And again, because I could sit there and go, well, it's not my fault. It's, it's my parents' fault. But it's not their fault either. It's the, maybe mm -hmm. it's their parents' fault. And maybe it's not their fault. Maybe it's their parents or their parents. We're talking about generational trauma here. We're talking yeah. about ancestral trauma here. You know, for those people who are, who are unequipped or unaware of that information, you know, go and check out Constellation Therapy. There's a great book called It Doesn't Start With You, and it understands how trauma can be handed down through epigenetics. You know, the indigenous communities know about this. Women know about this. It, this is something that has been going on for a long time now, but there's just not been a lot of awareness. Yeah. And so when, when I started to shine the light on those things and I started to not look at them from a place of blame, but look at them from a place of compassion, understanding, humility, and I guess you could say responsibility going well okay it's not my fault but it's my responsibility to continually shine the light on this and to feel all the darkness that's associated with it because again when, you, when i looked at these wounds these wounds have many layers of emotions and they have many waves of emotions and you know sometimes i get to the point where i think oh that wound is done and it's like well fucking really <laughs> mm. there's maybe a little bit more and and eventually yeah that wound will be done but it requires a lot of conscious curiosity seeking you know a conscious curious desire to seek and shine light on the darkest parts of who we are so that we can resolve them. Yeah. And that, that takes enormous levels of humility. That takes enormous levels of responsibility. But that also requires the absence of judgment. Yeah. Because it's not until, you know, we look at those things as ours, not our fault, our responsibility, that we can actually, you know, take the control back and actually start to resolve them. Yeah. And as we resolve those things, we our soul is then purified even more and this is what i'm learning the more we purify our soul the, the more our soul's purpose is able to shine through and the more comfortable we can sit in that and express that in whatever it is that we do day to day and how that looks yeah and so it's I'm almost still, sorry I'm, going. Saying, I'm, I'm still i'm still learning what's coming from it and it's only in conversations like this where i'm learning how to articulate it yeah and, yeah. and, and the frameworks are coming together the models are coming together and because you know everything i do i do with with a, with a purpose to go okay how can i help others with this yes and how can i support others yeah. with this you know, and, there's, and this has been not an easy process. The last six months have been the hardest six months of my life, Julie. Yeah. Without a doubt, the hardest six months of my life. For the first time in my life, I've actually experienced depression. You know, for the first time in my life, I've actually been suicidal. You know, because, you know, sitting in some of these emotions have felt so dark and so horrible that I haven't been able to see a way, a, a way out. It's felt like a cloud has enveloped me. Yes. And sometimes the pain has felt so great that I've, you know, been driving down the road praying, praying for a car to cross over and fucking head on me so I don't have to do it myself. Wow. You know, ah. Literally praying to die. Oh, yeah. I'm not kidding. And, um, but the only reason I was praying to die is because, and when you understand, you know, when you have a pain or a feeling so great that you're willing to die rather than feel it, why? No wonder we forget. No wonder we forget stuff. Mm. You know, Joe Dispenza say we, 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 70 to 80% of our childhood memories are false memories and I'd say most of those false memories are coming not because we're trying to make our childhood worse because we're trying to make our childhood better because we yeah. actually remembered our childhood as it was for some people they go holy shit my childhood was so fucking devastating but I thought it was great yeah. and I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with other males and other men now where I'm actually in really compassionate and loving ways I'm challenging them on, the, on the, them on their childhood memories and sure enough 
you don't have to look very far before you start seeing, you know, memories, emotions coming forward that are attached to memories of, you know, things that they didn't want to remember. And man, when you have emotions that feel so bad and so dark and so heavy, and you think the only way out is to kill yourself, man, for some people, that's what they'll do. And I, and this is the thing, I'm, I could never relate to people who were suicidal before. I could never relate to people who had depression before. I could give them tools and understand, but now, now I know what it likes to feel depressed. Now wow. I know what it's like to feel suicidal. And I don't look at that and go, well, oh, now I have this experience. And I go, who can I help with that knowledge? You know, who, who's in, and just maybe one person listening to this can go, oh, fuck. Now there's one person that can relate to what I'm saying. Cause I can tell you right now, when I was in the depths of feeling either suicidal and depressed, no one understood what I was going through. Yeah. No matter who I spoke to, no one understood what I was feeling. No one could understand me. And I felt incredibly misunderstood. And I found it very difficult to express myself because I had so much anger bubbling on the surface, under the surface that every time I felt misunderstood, the, the desire to feel would be overrun with the desire to f- defend. Yeah. And, um, but it's all coming back to the crux of learning how to feel. Yeah. Because the more we can feel the emotions in the moment, the less we will carry with us the more we can experience the traumas and experience the traumas and feel the emotions of the traumas as they happen. Okay. The less baggage we'll take from that. Yeah. Yeah. And I suppose what, what I'm thinking in that as well, because I've had those feelings myself, not about the being suicidal, but the, the thing about the, the generational weight almost on, on me to make the change because others couldn't. If yes. that maybe my maybe I'm stronger or there's something about me or I chose to take that on. Your soul but chose. I honestly believe you know, yeah. Trauma is like a baton. It gets yeah. passed down, passed down, passed down, passed down until at some point and again, it's not that you are necessarily stronger, but now based on all the work your ancestors have done, they have got you to this point yeah. where you are now ready. So it's not like you're necessarily doing this in isolation. It's like you're Let's call it three and a half thousand, eight and a half thousand, eight billion years of evolution to the point where it's now, now you, we now trust you. All of yeah. your ancestors are sitting there going, we now trust you to be able to yeah. do this work. Honestly, I've all, I've felt, I've actually felt that and felt, oh my God, is it, how do I do this? But, but in that, it's, I don't want to hand that on to my children or my grandchildren. So it's become even more important. So do you have that feeling as well that you, if you do as much as you can now, then there's less that your children, grandchildren have to manage? And well, here's with? what I'm noticing. When I resolve my shit, their behavior changes. Yeah. And so it's not like that. And again, this is the thing that a lot of people don't realize. They go, oh, fuck, I've wounded my child. Now it's their responsibility. No, no, no. You can still resolve that within them, you know, based on the meta dynamics of if you process that emotion, if you process that trauma, that there, because oftentimes we see behaviors in kids where they're actually taking Vanessa LaPointe talks about this, you know, that yeah. our kids will push our buttons to take us into our wound. Yeah. And when we're taken into our wound, what do we do? Do we feel it and we process it or do we blame the child and get angry at the child and just, and that's passing the wound down. Yeah. And, and whereas, and this is what I've noticed with my partner's daughter, like my partner's daughter, Ayana, she's a beautiful young girl, but she's a fierce little fucking woman. Like everybody wants a strong woman until they have to handle one. And she is <laughs> for real. For real, yeah. she is like one of the most strongest, resilient, persistent. Like she's, you know, either going to be an incredible world leader or someone's real pain in the ass. But <laughs> I, I'm erring to the side of world leader. But she used to just constantly take me into my wound, constantly mm. take me into my wound. But what I realized now, you know, I did six weeks of an enormous amount of work while she was away with her dad. Didn't see her for six weeks. And, you know, and the last time we saw each other, it was fucking volatile. Like she was hating me. You know, and I was like n- not her biggest fan because she was just pl- acting out in a way where I was judging her behavior and blaming her behavior for my responses and the anger that I was feeling. And, you know, she was always one, one little back chat away from me feeling an enormous amount of anger. And then I, I'm already in the work, but then she goes away and then I start doing really fucking heavy, deep work, really deep, deep, dark work. And I had to wait until the kids were away to do some really dark yeah. work. And then she comes back. And now all of a sudden out of nowhere... Up until this point, when I've been together with Christopher this point, about eight, almost 18 months, and she'd maybe said to me that she loved me twice, and both of them were through gritted teeth. <laughs> she, and she gets back, and before I even see her, she's getting her mum's phone, and she's sending me text messages telling me that she loves me and she misses me. That's Never beautiful. done that in the entire mm. life. And then we see each other, and it's literally like me reuniting with a lost child. Yeah. You know, she's heaving love on me and affection on me, and I'm going, and, I, and I'm thinking to myself, where's the little shit? Mm. where's the little bitch? And I'm like, and so, well, 
when my wound's not there, she's not going to show it to me. So your energies change, which oh, therefore really it changes that interaction. This is what kids do. Kids reflect our stuff to put us into our wound so that we can identify that there's something there to work on. Yeah. Whereas yeah. kids will reflect our stuff and we blame them. We get angry at them. You know, we, we, we belittle them and, and, and victimize, literally make them the victim of our wounds, mm. which is the generational trauma being handed yeah. on. When they're actually being of service to us totally, and the future so generations. Ignorant. We are so yeah. fucking ignorant sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm loving this conversation. I could talk to you for hours. But uh, so, <laughs> so when you think about the families, right? So say, for instance, I imagine there's going to be a lot of people that, you know, they're, they're their family, there's people with cancer, there's people, you know, with, with um, neurological conditions, there's people that may have had brain injuries, all sorts of things. What do you think families need when people are really, when somebody's either really, really unwell and may die or they have a very long recovery? So what do you think, what's going to serve families? What do they need? Oh, that's a big question, Julie. And I'm, I'm going to do, you know, uh, and again, I'm going to do a training wheels answer on that because it's not something I have an enormous amount of experience with, except for the second part, which is the brain injury part. I think the best thing that families can do is allow themselves to feel the emotions as they come up for what's going on, you know, because having someone that's really sick, that's a trauma. Losing mm. someone, either whether it be to a short-term illness, sudden illness or a long-term illness, that's a trauma. And, you know, for some people, the traumas are prolonged because, you know, they might have a terminal illness for months or even years at a time. And so it's like, you know, constantly scratching at a wound. And every time you scratch it, it's going deeper and deeper and deeper until all of a sudden you experience the loss. But you don't experience the loss when they die. You've been experiencing the loss for the last 18 months in anticipation. Yeah. And I think sometimes what we do is we go, well, I'll, I'll, once it's happened, then I'll, I'll deal with it once it's happened. I'll deal with it once it's happened rather than going, well, maybe I should just deal with it while it's happening. Yeah. You know, if I'm going to feel angry, feel angry, but look at what's, cause here's what I've learned about anger. Anger is a surface level emotion that in most cases is protecting you from something deeper that you don't want to feel that feels a lot. Anger is empowering. Anger is strong. Anger is defensive and dominating. And you know, I know most people when they're angry, myself included, I feel really powerful and quite strong. Yeah. I'm in a place of defense. And that's what anger does. It's a surface level emotion that protects us from feeling the ones that are under that. And so if you're mm. experiencing anger, what's below that? Okay. And, and, and again, Feel the emotions as they happen because otherwise you're going to end up with a suitcase full of emotions by the end of it. And now you're processing the suitcase or now you're trying to process the suitcases full of emotions and you're trying to organize a funeral and you're trying to process and grieve for the death that has been in anticipation for the last two years. Whereas if you can unpack the suitcase as you go, yeah. unpack the suitcase as you go. And so then when you experience the loss, then you can allow yourself to be, and I know this is going to sound strange, but be fully invested in the grief of the loss. Yeah. And by fully yeah. invested, I mean allowing yourself to fully feel you know, and whether you, you know, align with the, the five or the seven stages of, of loss or grief or whatever it is, it's not my area of expertise. But what I do know is there's a process to grieving. And one of the most important parts of the process to grieving in my very um, humble and very, well, not maybe not very humble, but I think I'm humble, um, uh, inexperienced position is to feel that grief, to yeah. feel those emotions, because all you're going to do is then perhaps wrap it up in anger. And then you're going to take it out. And this is what I've learned about wounds. Wounds, in most cases, only show when we feel safe enough to express them. And the, yeah. the, mo the relationships where we feel safest to express our wounds are the most intimate ones. And those intimate ones are either our intimate partner or our kids or our family. And that's yeah. where we do the most damage. And if we're lucky enough to have really intimate friends, in most cases, we'll show it to them. Yeah. And as I've said to you, one of the reasons I've avoided friendships for so long is because I didn't want them to see the ugly parts and then run away. Mm. And so I thought, well, if I just show up and show them my best parts, then they're never going to want to run away and they'll be friends with me for longer. In the yeah. meantime, I've been robbing myself of the opportunity to do work, but also robbing myself of the opportunity to really connect at a deep level with other human beings who maybe have the same feelings, have the same fears, have the same experiences, that, and they're looking for some level of you know, relativity or relationship as well. Yeah, or connection just because yeah. you understand. Yeah, Understanding. Such yeah. a powerful, powerful frame. Beautiful. So now that you've had those ex these experiences, and one of them's recent, but we know I know you've had lots of these experiences. What I mean, have you got a continuity plan in place for your business? Have you done succession planning? Have you have you got everything in place so that if something, say for the last episode, if you couldn't speak or you couldn't walk yeah. or you had died, is everything in place that everything will just go on without you, or have no. you not done it? 
not in its entirety, but we're certainly a, a darn sight closer to it than we were six months ago. But it's interesting because, as you know, with the work we do in K to Elite, we're all about contingency and key person risk. Yeah. And, and you know, the greatest key person risk you'll ever have in a business is the owner, depending on the level of um, dependence that the business has operationally on that owner being there. Now, it just so happens that I have probably one of the most codependent business models on the planet because it's a personality business. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a brand. It's a personality brand. And so my business is probably one of the worst businesses in the world to have because it is so dependent on me. But that being said, we were able to run, I think while I was off, we were able to run, I don't know how many different, I think it was maybe three. Oh, no, we ran a number of, oh. we ran all of our masterminds and we ran at least another two or three or four Nail It and Scarlet's whilst I was off recovering you know, through the use of recordings. And what's been really interesting is that has demonstrated to me, or well, that has forced us to accelerate that key person risk mitigation uh, at a rate of knots. We'd already done it. We'd already spent the last five years trying to mitigate key person risk, but we just didn't have everything in play. And now we are so much closer. It's because my, my, my goal would be is, you know, when, when I choose or when the, the creator chooses for me to leave this space, that I've got enough in place for my legacy to live on. And my legacy it is my kids, you know, it is my family, but it's also my, my messages and my words. And, you know, I think I've been given this incredible gift of being able to communicate in some cases, really hard, complex stuff and really simple to easy, relatable, you know, everyday ways that people can understand. And yeah. I, I don't think just because I leave that that should be lost or forgotten. Mm. You know, I, I would like to think that 400 years from now, I'm still having an impact on someone's life, whether it be through an echo of a memory or, you know, a, a rewatching of a video because I sometimes find myself watching videos in Napoleon Hill, you know, yeah. from the 1920s. Yeah, yeah. But now with the sophistication of technology, you know, as long as we do this well, you know, and Noah, like it's it's really clear to me that Noah's going to want to do something like this. Mm. And um, it's you know he's already saying that he wants to be my 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 video videographer. Like he's yeah. desperate to be my videographer, but he's been on st on stage, you know, almost every three months since the age of three months of age. Yeah. I've seen and, him up there. That's no, it. And he's and he's brilliant. Yeah. And he's got this incredible ability to just see through all of the bullshit in people and just see their soul. He loves everybody. Everybody yeah. loves Noah. He has this unique capacity to just bring the best out in people, make anyone smile. And he mm. loves everybody. He doesn't judge anyone. You know, he'll walk up. He loves the homeless people on the street in Byron. He yeah. just has this synergy with them where he'll walk up and start talking to them. Buskers, they walk up and start talking to them. He just has this incredible ability. And I see so much in myself and Noah and I don't want him to be me and, I, and I'm not no. trying to force him into been doing something that isn't aligned with his soul, but I just see this sweetness in this innocence that he has. And it's almost like, and this is come, comes back to what I was referring to earlier. The more work that we do for our kids, the more they can shine from a soul level without having yeah. to do the work. And so, you know, if we do it right, we're setting the next and the next and the next generations up to be fully expressive in the most beautiful ways because you know, some of us haven't been able to shine as brightly from a soul level as what we would like to because we've been busy fucking clearing out all the darkness so yeah. that the soul can shine. But the more we do that ancestrally, because ancestrally, yes, we pass down wounds, but ancestrally also pass down wisdom in our wounds. Not in yeah. our wounds, but we pass down the wisdom as well. And if we can get to the point where we're passing down a disproportionate amount of wisdom versus wounds, you know, we're going to create a generation of humans that are just going to be like nothing we've ever seen before. Yeah. And they will reinvent the way that we civilize. They will reinvent the way that we govern. They will reinvent the way that we, you know, as communities self-initiate, self-manage, self-lead. And, you know, rather than, because right now the path we're on is self-destruction if we're not careful. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I love your vision and I, and I love the way that you, you do turn complex things into simple things that people can understand. I think that's one of your superpowers, to be mm -hmm. honest. I've always thought that of you. So I've got one one more sort of deep question that I'd like to ask, and you you mentioned um, that you'd had the near death experience with your previous stroke, mm -hmm. and I suppose it, this is a big question that I suppose everybody thinks, but obviously you think that there's more than just you know we're here we're dead and that's it. You see a much bigger uh, thing than that, for want of a better word. So I'm interested in what's your 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 perception of why we're here like i know it's a, yeah. that quid question but no, what do you think it's, it's all about what question. what do you think what do you think it's all about why are we well, here alan watts would refer to out the human experience as the fruits of consciousness you know a apple tree produces fruit a pear tree produces fruit you know a mango tree produces fruit um and consciousness produces fruit and i think we are an evolution of expression of consciousness you know we're an evolution of expression of because I think it would be pretty arrogant 
there's two forms of arrogance in the world. One, I think it would be pretty arrogant to assume that there's no other life in this, um, in this, in in space, in galaxies. You know, to go, we're the only. How fucking arrogant is that? No, no, no. Our little planet. We are the only planet in the whole universe and all the multiple and countless galaxies with the only you know with the only planet with with fucking intelligent life on it that and you know what the reason that intelligent life avoids us is 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 in the media right now yeah they're avoiding <laughs> us at the point because they're probably waiting for a point where you know we'll be ready for that but i think that's the first level of arrogance to assume that we are alone and i'm not a fucking conspiracy theorist nor am i a, a, a you know a ufo watcher it's just it's just to me it's basic common sense how is that possible mm. when we have you know infinite numbers of galaxies in a universe that is infinitely unmeasured that we have yet to even explore outside of our own backyard. Yeah. You know, we've only really gone across the street to the moon and apparently that was once if it even happened. Um, so I think that's part one. Part two is it would also be pretty darn arrogant to assume that there isn't an incredible level of intelligence driving what everything that's going on. And by everything, I don't mean human behavior. I mean, development, evolution. I mean, the expression of this consciousness, you know, you and I, um, Julie and every other person who's listening to this, and I want everyone to hear this, you're a trillion dollars of biotech in a box. Mm. A trillion dollars of biotechnology. You are the most sophisticated form of biotechnology that we are currently aware of. Now, how do we know that? Well, how much technology, how, much, how, mu- how many mechanisms are involved just to breathe? How many mechanisms are involved just to have your heartbeat to be able to feel a pulse? How many mechanisms are involved just to be able to see the screen or listen to the words that you're hearing right now? There are an infinite amount of mechanisms playing out currently to enable us to have this experience in as human. So to say that there isn't some fucking incredible level of intelligence driving all this, again, is just a supreme level of ignorance backed up with an enormous level of arrogance to go, well, no, the human, humanity is it. Well, God, we are not even like I would suggest that humanity is the bottom of the barrel. And I don't mean to say that in a dismissive way, but when you look at the way some of some humans behave, when you look at the way some humans treat the planet, treat animals, treat each other, treat nature, that's not intelligence. That's ignorance. Mm. You know, that's absolute ignorance. And so, yeah, I do believe, do I believe in a God? Um, well, I think the acronym for God is grand organized designer. I do believe that there is an intelligence there sitting somewhere, somewhere in something. I don't know where that is. Um, and look, it's not just because I've taken some significant amounts of psychedelics and had some incredible, you know, out of body experiences. I've had my own out of body experiences just through my own confrontation with death, you know, and some some brain injuries. And I've had some incredible experiences, you know, just through, you know, the use of psychedelic therapy to go, wow, we are there's so much more to what's going on than we are aware of. And even when you start exploring quantum mechanics and particle physics, fuck me, you know, anyone who can just read entry level quantum mechanics and particle physics papers will understand. You know, they used to believe that the, the particle, the sorry, the atom is 99.999% energy and maybe 0.0001% mass. And they now predict, no, there's no mass at all. It's just energy. All energy vibrating at different rates of oscillation to give us the appearance and the illusion of mass. We are sitting in a massive vacuum of nothingness that is being compressed into a form of form into a into a form that we are interacting with every single day but when you look at it under the most sensitive instruments that we've got there's nothing there it's just yeah. nothingness it's infinite and so this is mm. either the most elaborate fucking simulation and elon musk is on the record as saying there's about an, i think he says there's about an 82 percent probability right now that we are in a simulation wow and for those of you who want to fucking battle test this go and google simulation therapy and give yourself a couple of hours to have your noodle blown you'll never look at the world the same again mm. Or it'd be pretty arrogant to assume that we, if we're not in a simulation, there is something so much bigger that is playing out right now. And, you know, based on the laws of thermodynamics that we know, energy is not created, nor is it destroyed. It's just constantly changing form. So even if we do self-destruct, even if we do blow this, you know, this, this planet up, our energy will be reconstituted. It'll be recycled back into the universal expressions of consciousness and yeah. whatever that consciousness looks like, whether it be another galaxy, another solar system, another planet, another form of intelligence, yeah. but we just hope it can evolve. Yeah, totally. I agree. So, okay. So, I mean, obviously time is, we're nearly up. So, but one last question there for, for everybody that's really thinking about, wow, there is so much today, but what would be the three maybe biggest takeaways that you've had from, you know, from your, your death experiences, from your dying experiences, from your, 
I don't know, the family experiences, the, what are the one or two or three things that you would say to people to really think about and get some clarity on? First one would be the three, the three levels of work, the head work, the heart work, and the soul work. Yep. Learn to distinguish. Because you might have done the head work, okay, but there's maybe a lot of heart work that you need to do. And once you've done the heart work, there's, you're going to find that there's more work to do at a soul level. Yeah. And that's going to look different to every single person. So you've got to do the, 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 you've got to do the work in those areas. The second thing would be to understand the importance of intimacy in doing the work. Because it's not until we are put into a proximity of intimacy that we got to get to see the, the best and the worst parts of us reflected back to us. And, and look at those things not with ignorance or blame or judgment. Look at those things with curiosity. Um, compassion and some level of understanding of where did this come from? Because it didn't start with me. Where did it mm. come from? You know, and the responsibility that comes with it. And it may not be, it may be your fault. It may not be your fault, but if it isn't your fault, and if it is your fault or if it isn't your fault, and if you are aware of it, it is now your responsibility. And the third thing would be to, oh, we're all going to die. We're all going to die, you know, and you're a trillion dollars of biotech in a box, but you're also $7 in a jar. Mm. And what I mean by that is if I was to be able to replicate you as a piece of technology right now, you'd easily be a trillion dollar patent. But also if I was to break you down to all of your compositions of mineral elements, you're $7 in a jar. Wow, I've never heard that before, $7 in a jar. So true though. So the we consciousness the, piece of it is huge. It's huge. We are the most valuable, but we are the most worthless. And our job is to find mm. our middle ground and go, we don't want to put ourselves too high up on that trillion dollar spectrum, but we also don't want to look at ourselves as our basic elements because we're not just our basic elements. We're the combination. We are, we are one of the most exquisite expressions of a recipe that you could ever have in this dimension that I believe. We are one of the greatest cakes that the creator has ever baked. Yeah. Um, but most people are behaving like a pancake. <laughs> yeah. For sure. So is there one or two books that you would recommend? To, so so if, it, if this conversation has blown people's minds or yep. made them think, oh, oh, yes, I sort of think that, but I don't know anything about it, like one or two books that they could start with? It didn't start with you, Constellation Therapy. Um, yep. The second one would be The Holographic Universe by Malcolm Talbot. And the okay. third one would be The Way of the Superior Man by David Dieter. Beautiful. Um, and I know it sounds a little sexist the way of the superior man. It does talk a lot about the masculine, but also the feminine, but understanding the dynamics in between. And, you know, one of the most important things that that book can really highlight is the importance of not knowing what to do and feeling like, because oftentimes people don't know what to do. Like, I don't know what to do. And knowing that that's actually a really powerful place to be. Yeah. Because if you don't know what to do and you've got this vacancy and you feel that vacancy with distraction and you feel it with things, when your soul's invitation comes along, to call you forward for whether it be for purpose or for work, you'll miss that if you're, if you're too busy trying to do because you don't like doing nothing. And mm -hmm. that's not a permission slip to sit on your ass and be a lazy person. It's your permission slip to go and spend some time in nature. It's your permission slip to deepen your practice with mindfulness and meditation and to really learn how to connect with the things that are important and just even learning how to connect with nature again. You know, nature speaks to us constantly, but are we listening to her? Are we listening to him? Are we listening to those signals? You know, one one of the things that I enjoy more than anything else now that I bought myself my I bought myself my dream house, my farm, and I'm very lucky because it's got a beautiful creek that runs through it. And now I find myself, you know, because I've been in recovery a lot because I get my fatigue and my stamina is still quite real for me. Um, but I I have found myself for the most part whenever I get really tired, I'll, I'll just sit down and watch like Netflix or something. And recently, I've found myself just grabbing a fucking deck chair, walking down the creek, putting it beside the creek, and just sitting there and watching sitting yeah. there and feeling, sitting there and listening and just being in nature, not being in nature, doing in something, just being in nature. Yeah. We Beautiful. are human beings, not human doings. You know, I think one of the things that would be really helpful is if we start learning how to be again, not do Facebook, not do Instagram, not do TikTok. How do we be with ourselves? How do we be with nature? How do we be with others you know, in a genuine, authentic and natural way? Beautiful messages came in. Thank you. So if people wanted to uh, get some more information about you or follow you on social media, what, what could they do? Uh, easiest place to look is kerwinray.com. 
but we're on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, TikTok, YouTube. We have an incredible podcast also called Unstoppable. Um, but we also have a range of different events. Um, for those people who are interested more in the in the performance and the psychology and the metaphysical stuff, we have a program called Power to Create that we're bringing back, which is a two to three day program yeah. where <laughs> it's coming back where I get to share my soul's purpose. Um, and it helps a lot of people. It's helped an, a disproportionate amount of people. And um, we also have um, the Fast Growth Summit. We've got actually the Fast Growth Summit coming to Newcastle, 23rd of March, Sydney, the 30th of March, which is our first live event in about two years. Uh, which is a free event. Actually, we're going to be doing this one for free. We have Nail and Scarlet, which is a three-day program. We have our K2 Elite, which Julie, uh, Julie, I should say, is one of our incredible partners, which is where we work with business owners you know, over a period of 12 months to six years to really support them to grow and scale. And we have businesses from you know, startup all the way up to 300 million coming through that program in, a run, in over 160 different industries. And uh, I think currently we've touched over 14 countries around the world. So... um. And the beautiful thing with K2, as you know, Julie, is we get to talk about this stuff all the time. Mm. I don't have to wait for an event. I can, you know, I can have these conversations every time we, we get together, yep. which is um, a beautiful, beautiful gift for both of us. Thank you. I just want to say a huge thank you to you personally, because honestly, knowing you has changed my life in so many positive ways. But thank you, thank you, thank you for being with us today. And uh, love you, K-Man, and I'll see you next week. And can I just say before we go, I want to thank you, Julie. Um, you have been such a pivotal part of my own growth. You are one of the most mothering figures that I have in my life. You are one of the most beautiful examples of an incredible feminine. Your your un your your compassionate matriarchal nature has just really been an incredible blessing in my life. And you've helped me in more ways than I'll ever be able to tell you in this in this little um, sample right now. But I want to thank you for your support, for your love, your care, and just for being you. Because anyone who knows you knows you are. And by the way, for those of you who don't know this, we call Julie Fletcher in K2, Julie fucking Fletcher. <laughs> because she is literally, what you see is what you get. She's one of the most authentic and genuine people that I've ever met in my life. And I feel incredibly honored and blessed to have you in mine. Thank you, Kami. Thank you, love. Love to you. See you next mm. week. See you next week. Bye. <laughs> Bye, love. <laughs> Have you ever thought about how you'd like to spend the last few days and hours of your life? Or how you'd like to acknowledge loved ones or your own life and death? We can help you to create an experience that's as individual as you are. Let us help. doulaconnections.com.au